Okay. So welcome everyone who's joining. Uh, thanks so much for hopping on. We're really excited to be doing this today. Uh, my name is Tanya Launhecht. I'm communications director for Outdoor Alliance. And uh, we are really excited to have um, an awesome group of panelists here today to talk to you about responsible recreation in the time of COVID-19. So I am going to have the panelists introduce themselves. Um, why don't we start with Katie? Hi all, thanks for joining. Uh, Katie Goodwin, I'm with Access Fun. I'm part of our policy team, policy analysts, and I'm also our California Regional Director based here in California. I am Angela Howe, Legal Director with Surfrider Foundation. I've been with the organization about 13 years and uh, have done a few beach access litigation cases as well as help uh, lead our beach access initiative. Hi, I'm Kevin Colburn. I'm the National Stewardship Director of American Whitewater based in Asheville, North Carolina at the edge of the Nantahala and Pisgah National Forests. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Todd Keller, um, the Government Affairs Director for the International Mountain Bicycling Association located here in uh, Washington, DC. And good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gabe Vasquez. I'm a on the board for Outdoor Alliance, I'm a city councilor here in Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, and amongst a whole bunch of other things, uh, hike, bike, hunt, and fish um, all around in Southern New Mexico. Thank you guys. And I'm in San Clemente, California. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Um, and I am in my parents' garage. So, <laughs> um, so I wanted to uh, go through a little bit of background about um, how we got here for this webinar and then um, the agenda for today. Uh, so first, a little bit of um, housekeeping, Zoom basics. Uh, most people, it seems like, have figured this out, but if you could just mute yourself and make sure your video is off, we'll keep the panelists' video up while we're going along. Um, Zoom is new to us and it's especially new to me, so uh, if there's fumbles, I just wanted to uh, apologize in advance. Um, also, all of us doing our best to work remotely, sometimes kids around. Um, so just wanted to put that out there that we're all working under these somewhat funny circumstances. Um, as we go along, uh, please feel free to use the chat function to ask questions. Um, someone right now has asked, they often have the option to mute themselves. It may be, I did select to mute folks when they come in. So if you don't have an option to mute yourself, you should already be muted. Um, but for the occasional person who might come in and notice that your speaker's on, just, uh, just to give you a heads up to mute yourself, but you should, you should all be muted for now. So please feel welcome to use the chat function. For most of you, that will be a little bit of a floating screen, either at the bottom or the top of your screen that will say chat and you can enter questions there. Um, please feel free to enter questions at any point during the webinar. We're going to save uh, a good bit of time at the end to answer those questions, and I'll go through and read them out and moderate them. Um, so please feel welcome to ask your questions at any point and know that we will try to get to them all. Um, so a little bit of background for this webinar. Um, this grew out of a lot of conversations that Outdoor Alliance was having as a coalition about how we should guide people to get outside safely right now. Um, as many of you know, there's just a, an outpouring of visitors to parks and public lands from like sidewalks and little parks near your house, um, sometimes to federal lands, even national parks that are open. Uh, it highlights how important open spaces are for our mental and physical health. Uh, most people um, who are on this probably care about the outdoors and understand how important they are to feeling good. Our goal today is uh, that we talk through some of the new guidelines for how to get outside safely right now um, to keep both landscapes and other people safe. Um, in part thinking about, you know, what's going to happen next when public lands start reopening, how we can keep one another safe, and how we can make sure we have continued safe access to these places. So just one big caveat before we begin that um, as a coalition, these folks have so much experience thinking about public land access, public land policy, recreation issues. Uh, none of us are epidemiologists or public health experts um, and COVID-19 is new to all of us. So 
it doesn't, I don't think there's an expert here and we're all kind of figuring this out as we go along. It's a situation that's rapidly evolving. Um, and what we hope to do is bring um, folks expertise as public land policy experts and access experts to weigh in on these issues as best we can. So the agenda for the day, the first half of the webinar will be kind of a guided conversation with some questions that we have for the panelists. We'll, they'll talk through uh, hacks for getting outside safely, guidelines, things that you need to know, how to get outside with your family if you might have more family with you lately, um, and kind of those background and basics, activity specific uh, questions and ideas. And then we're gonna move on to an open Q&A section. So again, you can type your questions into the chat function and I will do my best to compile them and we'll go through and try to answer as many as we get to. Um, so we wanted to start actually by asking you all some questions. So put together some polls. So it might take me a second to open them up, but um, I'm gonna open some polls and we'd love to know some questions about what you guys are doing. So the first question is, are you all seeing this on your screen now? It's a, uh, where do you live? So how would you describe where you live? Is it a more urban area, a more rural area, gateway community, smaller city or other? Um, so let's give folks a, a minute to answer these. Um, and can you all see the, um, how people are voting or is it just me that can see the results? Okay, I'm assuming it's just me. Okay, all right, I'll read them out in just a second. Um, so giving folks a, another moment. Okay, so it looks like about half of folks, um, I'll end the poll and hopefully it'll still show. Is it showing the answers to you all now? Um, I'll read them out. It's, uh, okay, sorry that you can't see. Uh, all right, so a little more than half live in an urban or suburban area. Um, oh, share results. Thank you all for, thank you Amos for uh, the good tech help. Okay, so now you should be able to see it, yeah. So about half in urban, suburban areas, 20% uh, in smaller cities, 25% in a rural area or gateway community. Cool, okay, a couple more. Um, let's see, how do I do the next one? All right, the next question is, have you changed your recreation patterns since COVID-19 started? So are you recreating more, are you recreating less, or are you recreating about the same amount? Uh, yeah, good question. Someone's asking, can you tell how many people participated in the poll? It's about 300. Um, almost everyone participated in the last poll. All right, so ending the poll, sharing the results. So it looks like most people are recreating less, um, about 25% recreating about the same, 14% recreating more. Okay, next question. This question is, uh, what activities are you doing outside lately? So I think you, you should be able to select more than one here. Okay, and I think these will be interesting for our panelists to see what activities folks are doing. And a lot of people are saying they're using, they're recreating in different ways than they were before. Yeah. And I think that's true. It's true for me. I'm sure a lot of folks feel that way. Yep. All right. I'm giving it another about 10 seconds on what have you been doing outside? And then we'll see the results. So um, about half of people are hiking, 85% are walking, 25% trail running, mountain biking. Um, less climbing than I would have expected um, for usual activities. 15% are paddling, 36% other. Um, all right. Okay, let's do just a couple more questions. So this is how far are you going from home when you're recreating? Are you going less than five miles, less than 10 miles, less than 20 miles, greater than 20 miles? So 
Some folks suggested adding a uh, road biking. That's it. Yeah, really good point. We, we, we should definitely add that. Okay, giving another couple seconds on how far are you going? And I'll show folks the results. All right, so most people are staying within five miles of home. Um, not very many people going further than 20 miles. Okay. All right, and this is something that uh, several folks have just mentioned in the comments. Um, what's your current risk level? So have you mellowed out? Um, are you taking fewer risks, more risks, about the same? Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and share the results. As you might have guessed, so 80% of people taking fewer risks than before, uh, about 20% the same as before. Um, and someone has asked, asked, will this be recorded? Yes, we're going to record this and we will post it so you can listen to it later. So if you have to hop off, um, this will be recorded, send it out, and we'll also make sure it's on our website. Okay, and then the last question that we're curious about is, are you wearing a mask while you recreate? Okay, giving it another second. And I'm gonna go ahead and share the results. So 12% are wearing a mask, 56% not wearing a mask, and 32% only when you see other people. Okay, so great. Thank you guys for all uh, answering these questions. This is interesting to us too as we um, go ahead and share our guidance. Um, all right, let me close down these polls. So to begin, I wanted to just go through briefly, um, can you all see this infographic on your screen now? So this is a graphic that we put together um, as Outdoor Alliance as a coalition. So folks on this panel have you know, weighed in and we put together some basic guidelines for how to get outside during a pandemic. Um, we put this out a couple weeks ago. So I'll run through this briefly and then we're gonna launch into more sport specific questions. So the first basic guideline is uh, make the health of others your number one priority. So with guidelines changing rapidly, you know, making sure that you're following the most stringent guidelines for your local state, um, county, your closest area, and uh, thinking of others and their health uh, first and foremost. Um, the second principle we came up with was you can go outside cautiously. So for most people, getting outside is a way to maintain your mental and physical health. Um, but of course, with the caveats, don't go outside if you've been sick. Make sure you're keeping a safe distance from others. Uh, be careful with the car, right? Don't go in the car with anyone that's not in your immediate household. So don't go in a big group. Uh, Kevin will talk a little bit about shuttling. Um, avoid busy areas and times of day, wash your hands, uh, bring what you need, follow CDC guidelines. The third principle we suggested is stay close to home. So uh, try, you know, this is not a time to go to that recreation destination you've been dreaming of. Um, Katie, maybe you could talk about that in Bishop a little bit, um, but staying, you know, as close to your backyard, your local park as you possibly can. Uh, the fourth principle is keep it chill. So try not to get hurt, uh, be as safe as possible, lower your risk level. Healthcare systems are overwhelmed. Um, search and rescue is at lower capacity. You don't wanna add to the burden. And then finally, respect closures, be a good steward. So if places are closed, respect those closures, don't go there. If they're open, be mindful that they have probably limited oversight, limited maintenance, uh, bring what you need and take everything with you when you go. Uh, so today, is there anything that you all would add to that or that I missed there? Okay, all right, so I'm, I'm really gonna stop talking now and we're gonna move on and I wanna hear um, all of y'all's good advice. So 
to start, the first question that I wanted um, to ask is, are there specific considerations for your activity or your region since you all are spread out um, or your constituency that you think folks should think about when they're getting outside right now? Why don't I kick it off with Kevin? Because I know you have some things to say about shuttling and paddlers. Oh, sure. Yeah, well, one of the things about paddling rivers in particular is that you have to run shuttle. So you have to get your car to the bottom and then get back to the top. Uh, and we're definitely encouraging people to be creative and use human powered means uh, to do shuttles. So bike, hike, run your shuttle. And a lot of people, um, I think people we've heard are doing this together where they're biking sometimes together to run shuttle and it's actually making their trips more fun. So just be creative and be committed to doing that. And I'll throw one. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll throw one out there, and this is specific to New Mexico, but maybe other places like Utah and Arizona too. Um, and I'd say for for now, you know, please don't visit tribal communities or public land surrounding tribal communities. For me, this is kind of a personal plea. Um, in New Mexico, Navajo Nation accounts for more than 50% of the state's COVID cases, and to risk them with more infection. Um, with uh, would be irresponsible, I think, and sensitive. And so many of these communities don't want to see tourists right now. Um, in addition to tribal communities, other small, smaller rural communities that don't have the healthcare resources or capacity to be dealing with folks um, are, uh, you know, who, who may come into contact with people. Be mindful of that. Uh, in New Mexico right now, it's it's turkey hunting season. And so many rural communities and tribal communities put up signs asking folks to, to kind of to stay out essentially. Um, and so I think that's one consideration in terms of if you choose to go somewhere, um, know what kind of capacity and what kind of state communities are in. Thanks, Gabe. Yeah, I can um, share from Access Fund's perspective. Um, we actually have come out with a similar infographic, similar to um, what we have here with Outdoor Alliance, um, you know, with climbing. I mean, I know a lot of our various human rec based sports are kind of site specific, but climbing, obviously, there's no climbing unless you reach the destination, you're searching out rock. Um, you know, I live here in Bishop, California, which is definitely a gateway community and an international climbing destination. And it's been um, very interesting to see how this has all evolved. But of course, from Access Sense perspective, we're really encouraging climbers. Um, one, to follow whatever state federal mandates are in place. In California, we're still under a full um, shelter in place order. So that means you really shouldn't be driving around um, far to recreate and seek out climbing. Um, and you know, from a general perspective of Access Fund, we're just really trying to also think about site specific issues we have with climbers. Um, we share gear, we're all touching the same things. Climbers put gear in their mouth sometimes, like you grab a rope to clip it. Um, you know, you're in close contact with your partner touching rocks. So we're really working to get answers on that from doctors and, and sorting that out. Um, and so again, similar to Gabe, but uh, you know, it's just think about where you're going and not also putting these smaller communities at risk um, if you decide you wanna to travel to recreate. Um, Angela, are you, do you want to, hey Todd, how about you go and then Angela can weigh in because she has a couple slides that I can show. All right, trying to get off mute there. Uh, again, good afternoon, everyone. You know, with, um, with mountain bikers, you know, we're trying to take a common sense approach, right? Uh, while our focus at IMBA is more trails close to home, uh, that's a work in progress and not everyone has trails close to home. Uh, me, for example, I live uh, right in the city in Washington, D.C., uh, in a er, you know, very urban neighborhood. So if I want to go get my, to my trails, I have to drive. Uh, and what we're trying to do is think about, okay, how much are we risking by driving there? Are we exposing ourselves to other riders? Um, are we giving enough space on trails to other riders? And um, so we're really asking everyone really to follow what their local governments are doing. And I'll give you a good example. In Northern Virginia, we have uh, the Northern Virginia parks folks in, in the state of Virginia have closed most of the parking lots 
to parks. Trails are open, but they're asking people not to drive and, cl and clog up the streets and park illegally. Uh, you know, there are some workarounds and a lot of um, uh, a lot of talk on our listservs that you can park in this park shopping area, then ride over to the trails. Uh, and people are, are, are managing that um, themselves. But really, we're telling people, if you have a trail close to home, ride that trail. If you absolutely have to, or you really need to, because, you know, we talk about your physical health is, is as important as your mental health. And a lot of us um, in the, the exercise in this space or, or our, our diehard riders, paddlers, climbers, whatever, um, so much of our activity in our sport is mental health, is getting out and staying healthy. But if you have to go out, go out early, go out late, do a, do a night ride, do an early morning ride, do a sunrise ride. Um, you know, we, I've been doing that, getting up before my kids get up and it's tough, but it's fun actually. And, and uh, uh, but yeah, just, you know, be smart, be, you know, hold common sense. And, um, you know, and I hate to say this, uh, but go get a road bike. You know, they're still fun, right? Even the mountain bikers, I have a couple. Awesome. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that Angela can chat about surfing a little bit. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So just from a um, beachgoer surfing ocean recreation standpoint, um, Surfrider's message has already evolved somewhat. Um, you know, I think for the first month or so, we were really saying, stay home, shred later. Let's flatten the curve. Let's get the rates of new COVID down um, so that it will be more safe to go outside soon. And um, you know, thankfully, we are seeing some places slowly reopen. So now it's looking ahead, when should we go surfing and how? Um, and that's really what we're focused on now. We're seeing a few, um, a few more openings, kind of uh, San Diego has a phased plan in their county, Orange County just approved Laguna Beach and San Clemente yesterday. Um, places throughout the U.S. Are, are opening back up to beachgoers, depending on how the crowds have been. Um, so really you have to check these local closures and, um, you know, respect them as well because that overcrowding can then re-lock down the beaches. Um, so that's, that's definitely what we're focused on. I think with Todd, I agree, the stay home part is really hard, especially for surfers because it's very close to stay local, locals only. And that locals only vibe, we, we definitely don't want. And we think the beach is for everyone. And there are some, you know, coastal access equity issues at play. At the same time, we wanna make sure all communities are protected like Gabe was bringing up. So it's a really tricky balance. Um, and for that reason, we've actually enlisted several experts. So that's the next slide. We, we have um, now a Surfrider Foundation expert uh, task force. Um, and we have Dr. Georges Benjamin, who's with the uh, American Public Health Association, the executive director, uh, people like Antoinette Codero, who um, was head of the Civil Rights Division of the California Attorney General's Office, um, who know about environmental justice issues, who know about public health issues, and they're helping inform our policies and guidelines that we're in turn giving to local governments, to state government, that are making these decisions. So this, this expert task force is really formed at that policy level, but at the same time, we're gonna use it to help inform individuals and in how you should behave. You know, whether you should stay six feet, 10 feet, when to wear a mask, things like that. So really important individual personal health choices, but also the entire management system as well. Awesome. So I wanted to pick up on one of the threads that Todd was mentioning, which is like, you're getting up early to go out and ride. Like, what are some of the hacks or tricks you've discovered lately to get outside in ways that are safe? Or are there like cool new local spots you're discovering? I can jump in with, oh. I can I jump in with one really quick. It's just parking, like figuring out unusual places <laughs> to park where people don't congregate. So, yeah. you know, instead of parking at the normal put in or the normal trailhead, you know, park at friends' houses and park, you know, random pullouts and just spread out um, parking. And that, that helps with the, the goal, but also helps with the impression of crowding. Yeah. So, um, so the mountain bikers, so we've, uh, you know, if you're a commuter, which I'm assuming a lot of us are, a lot of us ride bikes um, that are very different, uh, whether they're road bikes, whether they're commuter bikes, we all have bells. But not a lot of folks ride with bells on their mountain bikes, so we're encouraging folks to do that. 
uh, locally and otherwise, just to let people know that you're behind them or if they're looking off at something in the woods as they're hiking or they're walking their dog, you can ring that bell plenty of distance away to let them know that I'm approaching, you know, we're gonna have to pass each other at some point. So that, that's been helpful to a lot of people and, and the feedback personally that I've had is thank you for letting us know you're behind us instead of just coming on your left, on your left, and you're coming fast and you can't judge that. So that's, that's been helpful. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate the two things I said before. Uh, ride early, right? Uh, you know, and I, I mentioned Virginia, how they close their parking lots. Maryland, we have our parking lots open in the parks. So you can still go there. But if you hit it at two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon on a beautiful 70 degree day, it's gonna be hard to, to find a spot. Um, it's gonna be hard to keep your distance. If you show up at six o'clock in the morning when the gates open at 530, uh, there's no one there and you're going to have a plenty of time to, to ride around. Uh, another thing we've been asking folks is slow down. A lot of folks are riding the same trails over and over again, but we ride them fast. Slow down. Don't try to don't try to, you know, do your KOM or QOM and look around because the, it's the parks and the places we ride are really amazing. And if you slow down and just stop for a water drink and look around, you're like, wow, I didn't know there was a barn, you know, an old barn there. I didn't know that there was this here. It's, it's really amazing. So this is the time to slow down, go out, ride, fall in love with your bicycle and just take your time. Katie or Angela, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I can add uh, a few things. So similar to Angela, you know, um, with climbing, the messaging has been for quite a while to maybe not climb at all. So for a while, Access Fund, we were putting, we've been putting out a series called um, the Weekly Stoke, right? And we've had climbers sending us all kinds of um, pictures of them like climbing in their kitchens or off whipping in their bathroom or really creative training tips. Um, I know people are getting pretty strong doing a lot of um, training um, and that sort of thing. And, you know, as we start moving into these different states are opening up at different rates, um, again, a similar messaging, thinking about, you know, how local can you stay if you get there and the parking lot is totally packed, um, you know, maybe you need to get more creative of where you go, trying to find this balance of staying local, but, um, you know, if, if it's too crowded, then maybe we need to back down or go at different times where it's not um, high, you know, middle of the day on a weekend might not be the time to be going out. And again, also thinking about, yeah, when you're tra traveling and stuff, um, should you be traveling right now? So. Yeah, and I think I, I was talking about it earlier, but um, just keeping your distance, turning around if it's crowded. Um, I saw a funny meme that said, crowd hating surfers join crowd to keep waves crowded. So <laughs> there are some protests going on right now and I think that's what it was referencing, but generally surfers kind of hate crowds anyway and, and want their space and I think we're just encouraging that. And Tanya, I just want to throw this one out there. Yeah. Um, is I, So I started running a lot more and got to know my neighborhood. I got to know almost every street uh, in and around my neighborhood, right? Because I could just step out my front door and, uh, meet a lot of interesting people, see a lot of interesting lawn ornaments and yeah. <laughs> and that kind of thing. Uh, but you could even make it a challenge, right? How many streets in your neighborhood could you run in a month or a week or something like that? So yeah. You get creative with it. Um, how are your recreation habits incorporating your kids more? So one of the things we, we talked about before this was like, you know, you're, there's not much childcare right now. So you're getting out and your family's with you. Um, are there things that you're doing that are making that easier? Uh, we have some rowdy wiffle ball action going on in our backyard <laughs> right now. <laughs> <Top of touch. laughs> um, and then like giving piggyback rides to a 45 pounder and 55 pounder once they both hopped on me. <laughs> so getting yoked, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would just say that in my experience, I you know, right at the beginning of all of this, I didn't know how much to let my kid play with other kids. And I found yeah. that, you know, kids are really gross. So you, you just, they, they touch yeah. everything and touch each other. But if you can find them to a boat or a bike or tie them to a rope, they're really um, 
in, incapable of touching other children and, and being gross. <laughs> so I just feel like our activities work really well and compared to like a general play date or even a yard play date where you constantly have to be yelling, you know, like, oh, get away. You know, like we need space and blacklisting certain kids because they don't get it. Um, so I just, I found that like our, these kind of activities work really well. So, so, so much of, so much of my cycling, I race for a local team here in Washington is centered around training and perhaps, um, you know, harder rides. Um, and I've realized that when I go out with my kids and I've been riding with my kids a lot, that we're going out just to ride our bikes. And it's sort of this opened up this, you know, what I forgot as a kid, how much bikes can be fun whether it is my, my, my road bike every once in a while or my mountain bike. Um, I also am lucky enough in Washington, D.C. to have a rather large yard. So um, we, we, uh, we renovated our basement about five years ago, and I promised my wife that I would do something with all the dirt that we dug out of the basement. Well, five years later, I have a big mound of dirt in the back, so we decided to do a little pump track back there with my kids. So we've, they've been riding in our backyard. Now, that doesn't work really well for our grass in our backyard, However, and we're going to sacrifice the grass for some some fun off road riding in the back uh, in, in the backyard. But you know, it's just getting out with them. We're doing a lot of dog walking. The dogs are are benefiting greatly from this. I'm walking the dogs, um, and just trying to get outside and get some sunshine. You know, they haven't been able to play with their friends. Um, you know, their they their lives were overturned. You know, probably most most more than ours were at that time. Um, they don't have the skills to deal with the stress. So if we can get them outside just exercising in the sun, uh, it's, it's gonna go a long way for their stress and their mental health as well. So I've been trying to do as much as I can with them uh, on the bike and off the bike, but yeah. Cool. Um, I wanna talk about trail issues for a minute. So uh, what kind of etiquette are you seeing or recommending for how people move past one another on the trail, whether you're walking, uh, hiking, trail running, mountain biking especially, um, what do you suggest? Because I know a, a lot of us are really uh, cautious about stepping off the trail because we've you know, been taught for years to stay on the trail. Um, so how do you suggest folks handle that? Uh, I can take that if you want me, Tanya. Yeah, um, talk about biking first. I think that'll yeah, be good. This is, a, this is a sensitive subject for sure. I don't have a great answer. Um, um, but again, it's being a good being a good actor on the trails it starts with that right it's the bell it's letting people know you're approaching them slow down again you know if you're not on a training ride there's no races this year none of that um and just be really courteous to other folks and it's communicating with them right i'm coming up behind you or i'm approaching whatever it may be they'll communicate with you um the best way that we've been able to solve it from the mountain biker perspective is if you give enough room, try to find a spot on the trail. And all trails are different from all over the country. The desert trails are different than the mid-Atlantic trails, different than the northeast, the southeast, north, northwest, on and on and on. So you may have a spot where you can hop onto a rock in the south desert southwest to just to let people pass you. Um, in my case, we are pretty heavily wooded areas. So we'll just try to look for an opening. Oftentimes what I'll try to do is set my bike down just off the trail and just step a few feet off rather than trying to ride up because we don't want to create a, uh, you know, a wider trail and then just step back onto the bike and keep going. Um, that's probably the best way we can do it. We just, we, you know, you want to make sure you're not stepping on anything um, that you could break off or, you know, obviously poison ivy. I'm very allergic, so I know what it looks like. Try to stay away from that. Uh, but just be trying to be as careful as possible. It's not a it's not a perfect scenario, but it's really the best one that we've come up with to try to leave no trace, to try to make sure we don't damage the trail, make sure that we don't create a new trail by riding up it, et cetera. So that's what I got. I can add a little bit of perspective to what we're doing in New Mexico, at least in Las Cruces. Um, we're having a debate right now as a city council of, about when the right time to open up uh, local trails is again. Mm -hmm. um, and we're getting some mixed mix signals from the public, uh, which to me is a sign that it's probably still not safe to open everything back up. Um, a month ago, we made a decision to close all, all, all of our local trails and parks, even those that were perceived to be places where social distancing could still happen, uh, mixed use could still happen. And we got quite a bit of backlash on that. Many folks um, knocked down the barriers that we put up, 
uh, the do not enter signs were torn down and people created their own rogue trails or entryways into the parks. And so, you know, that wasn't a good look for the outdoor rec community in general. And so what we did instead was say, um, there's many places on BLM land um, in and around the Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks National Monument that are still open to the public, uh, not the developed sites because those were closed uh, by the BLM, but there's all kinds of dispersed trails, different areas where, where folks weren't used to going. And so for the everyday dog walker, occasional jogger or trail runner, there's still plenty of places in the city um, on sidewalks uh, where, where they could you know, enjoy their recreational activities. Um, but one of the things that I've seen that's been really cool is that more people are getting to these more remote um, areas right outside of our community and exploring trails they haven't before where they can be, um, you know, safely away from each other. Um, and so I think it's, it's being mindful of that, right, is, is making sure that if you pull up to that trailhead and it's, you know, cars, cars are, you know, full of people, um, that you take a chance on going somewhere else and, and try something a little bit different. Gabe and maybe Angela as well, would you be willing to talk a little bit more about that, about how local governments are making decisions to limit access right now and why they might be doing that? Sure, go ahead, Gabe, I'll, I'll follow up. Okay, um, so in New Mexico, there were no specific outdoor recreation guidelines that were laid out by the New Mexico governor. And so um, we applied the public health guidelines that, that were put in place, such as groups of less than five people staying six feet apart and no mass gatherings to our decision making, our local decision making when it came to closing local parks and trails. And so when we closed our parks and trails, it was because we couldn't guarantee that we could meet those public health guidelines. And that's, that was really the bottom line. Uh, we couldn't control how many people were gathering and where. And so trails were getting more crowded, parks were getting crowded, um, and we couldn't enforce those regulations at every park. So we decided to close close all of our local parks for the time being. Um, you know, the, the BLM also chose to close their developed recreational sites, uh, but there's still, you know, plenty of, 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 like I said, primitive trailheads that are still open. Um, and so right now we're basically following the governor's recommendations. We're in lockstep with her. Uh, the governor did come out and say, you, it, this doesn't mean that you can't go outside. Your stay at home order doesn't mean that you can't go outside. It just means you have to be responsible about where you do it and how you do it. Um, for us as a local government, you know, we, if we can enforce and meet the public health guidelines when it comes to people gathering outside, uh, then we will gladly open those. Um, or if it's driven by science and data that says that infection rates are low enough for us to open trails and parks, then we'll do that. But it's frustrated a lot of people. It's been a hard decision, especially for me, since I, I love being outside all the time. Um, but it's, um, it's, I think it's the right decision, especially when you're looking at parks that have playground equipment and that kind of thing. Um, kids are going to be touching that. Families are going to be touching that. So even though there's a Frisbee disc golf course or something at the same park, uh, where people might be able to do that safely, um, we kind of have to close it all down until um, until the state uh, changes its its direction. Yeah, and I can tell from the chat, you know, I think there's a there's a ton of confusion right now about what's going on locally, statewide. You know, in, in Santa Cruz, um, they shut down beaches except for locals only. Um, whereas in New Jersey, the governor came out and said that it's illegal to say locals only. So you're seeing a ton of different things. I know our community is very confused and I would just encourage everyone to check their local cities websites. The, the governor, what the governor is saying as well, state parks, national parks, and this is all in flux. I mean, they're trying to look at uh, public health data, um, you know, being very science-based. That's what we're encouraging from Surfrider as well. Um, and being very solutions-based. So, um, you know, with these phased in approaches, you can be on the beach, but you have to be active, you have to be moving, um, no sedentary beach going, no crowding shoulder to shoulder. Um, so, so you can phase one recreation and then maybe phase two is open up uh, for the fuller uh, public, maybe later in the summer, but we just don't know now. So it does make planning and, and planning for trips very difficult. And I think, you know, you've, you've seen confusion on the part of uh, just individuals going out. You've seen uh, uncertainty and lack of coordination with lawmakers even who has the jurisdiction uh, to make the laws. Uh, in, in California, Governor Newsom said everything's shut down in Orange County where I live. And then uh, there's people at the beach in Orange County. <laughs> so, you know, is it, is it local, is it state? I mean, Newsom does have uh, the, the authority under the law, but you have to have the local sheriffs enforce it. So um, it's, it's definitely gotten confusing. That's where Surfriders stepped in and encouraged um, 
cities to work with the governor to come up with a reopening plan. So we've already seen that in Laguna Beach and San Clemente um, and other places in Orange County. Um, and then you're seeing outrage when people are told no and no for so long. So that's why we're really striving to be solutions based, striving to get to yes, but how can we do that carefully and make sure we're also protecting public health? Yeah, that's great. I want to start getting to some of these questions because I'm seeing um, some follow-ups to some of the, the stuff you all are sharing. One of the most common questions is, what do you all think about dispersed camping? So I think people are looking ahead to the summer and um, is it going to be okay to not go to an established recreation site if those are closed, but can you disperse camp? Uh, maybe, maybe Gabe could start um, on this one and other folks could chime in. Yeah, so I, I can start with this. So um, I mentioned earlier that it's turkey hunting season in New Mexico, and so that's a big deal for a lot of folks um, who, who set up turkey camp, usually in large families, right? So you go uh, with your fellow turkey hunters and you go to somewhere really in the backwoods in the wilderness area, somewhere in the uh, many of our national forests where uh, traditionally it's just, it's a fun thing to do, but what we've asked people to do and what the Department of Game and Fish asked people to do is say, hey, you still can go turkey hunting. You still can set up that wilderness camp. Just don't do it with other people. Do it with the members of your household. And so for the most part, I think people follow to that. Um, they didn't want to lose their opportunity, uh, you know, to, to, to have that, um, uh, that wild experience out in the woods. And so I would say the same rules would apply in terms of travel, right? If you can find a place to safely disperse uh, to have a, a camping experience in a, in a remote site or a primitive site where you don't have to stop at a small town to buy supplies or, you know, to refuel. Um, I, I think, you know, for the most part, that's pretty safe, right? What you can control in your environment and in your experience, if you're not coming into contact with folks um, and you can safely do that, right? And, you, and you're experienced at doing it because that's the other part of it too, right? The, the lack of capacity when it comes to search and rescue or um, other, you know, our, our healthcare um, systems are overwhelmed right now. So um, I would say it's it's an individual basis, you know, how comfortable you are doing it, how close it is to you, um, and, and how confident you are that you can do it without contacting other people. Can I jump into? Oh, okay. to Katie. Okay. I'll go real quick. I just saw like um, one of our comments, Suzanne also mentioned, you know, I think we've seen that theme popping up in the chat box here of following those standard leave no trace practices or access when we have the climbers packed, which is very close to leave no trace, but specific to climbing. Um, and one other thing I just wanted to know is that even with dispersed camping, if it's technically open, um, like Gabe said, really checking what the local orders are. I know certain forests are keeping gates closed, winter access gates, they're just keeping them closed for now. And another thing to note is that a lot of our forests um, were already underfunded. Now they're not filling seasonal positions. So there's already going to be a severe lack of even maintenance or opening of um, actually maintained facilities. And just really thinking about if you're going into the a dispersed area and you're not disturbing people, making sure you're packing out your trash, how you might be impacting those gateway communities. Um, I know that's still a huge concern here in the Eastern Sierra is um, people coming out here and dispersed camping. Uh, and it's gotten a little heated sometimes. We have locals actually going out and like knocking on campers and asking people where they're from and um, kind of a wild west feel. So, that's just kind of my input on that, yeah. Yeah, I just add to that um, it's gonna vary by where you're at because every state, like the states all seem to be moving to a phased approach. Um, and as I said, in Washington state, it's not a switch, it's a dial. So, um, you know, it's gonna be gradually reopening, things will be gradually more okay and it can go backwards. So I think just, you know, and then down to the county level where you have individual counties interpreting state rules differently. So just, you know, wherever you're at, just, you know, see what the opportunities are and see what's okay. So I have another question. It's in the Q&A. So I'm going to say answer live and see if you all can see it. Um, it you probably don't see anything, do you? But the question is, uh, what advice do you have for public land managers as recreation sites start to open back up? What should we be considering about how to balance safety with access? So I can jump in there really quick. Um, I mean, obviously that's that's a pretty big question, but um, you know, specific to there's been a lot of talk about 
risk, and I think there's kind of two levels of risk. There's the physical risk that you're putting yourself in, potentially doing your recreational activity. And then there's the risk of potentially coming in contact with individuals and spreading the virus. Um, and one thing we've really been talking about with Access Fund, and we are also starting to work with some epidemiologists and trying to get some answers is, um, it's not really up to the land manager to be managing the level of physical risk. Like they shouldn't really be putting restrictions on what trail you decide to ride or what climb you decide to ride, but more um, as they move forward, thinking about how are we managing risk of exposure of the virus if it continues to travel around. So um, that's the reason a lot of the maintained facilities are closed right now because they don't have plans in place to keep like bathroom facilities sanitized and. So that might be um, a hurdle for land managers to tackle, especially in the bigger parks. Yeah. I just say, you know, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with figuring out the difference between setting and behavior. So there are recreation settings that the agencies manage that are entirely appropriate for good behavior. And some people, most people probably will choose to comply with, with local guidelines, but some won't. And I don't know, it's hard. I mean, I'm looking at Gabe thinking like, gosh, what a, what a hard position to be in, you mm -hmm. know? But I certainly think settings where safe behavior can happen, I think, you know, should be allowed if possible. And if I can just add to that, I think um, the guidelines for reopening, especially national parks and, and larger areas with more visitation and more heavy and frequent visitation, um, really should be, you know, strictly set in place by the Department of Interior, by Secretary Bernhardt, uh, before kind of opening opening all national parks with a one size fits all strategy. And so, um, I'm I'm not entirely confident that DOI is going to do that. And so that's when it, it really does come down to a lot of personal responsibility because I fear that our land managers and our parks employees and our and our uh, public lands employees are, are going to probably be um, continue to be exposed to certain risks interacting with people uh, at the, you know, at the behest of just opening up everything um, because I know the American public is, is getting, is growing restless. And so I think that that behooves us to have more of that personal responsibility to make their jobs easier. Right. So. Yeah, I think, I think this is a big question and it's a hard question for all of us to answer because it's, it's really two sides. It's, getting out and trying to um, exercise and trying just to get away from perhaps your family, perhaps your basement, oh, I'm in my basement now. Um, but, you know, really trusting our healthcare professionals and with the understanding of how this is spreading and trying to balance those two in conjunction. What none of us uh, certainly don't want is our land managers to our or have expertise in managing our public lands to become um, decision makers when it comes to medical decisions. So it really, they really have to work together. And that's what we encourage now is the land managers to work with their local health officials, um, whether on the federal side, because even if it's a federal land, it's local, the, 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 the COVID-19 is spreading local. So really have to do that. Um, we're always willing to help. We're always willing to assist in any way we can but it's really hard for us because we're not those we're we're not medical experts, as as Tanya said, it you know to kick off the mm -hmm. the webinar here. And so um, again, I, I think you know I know Bob Ratcliffe's on the on on the call as well, and you know just you know they're they're in a tough spot because I know they're getting pressure to say open up, open up, open up, and um, it may be difficult for them to make that decision without real good understanding of how this is spreading. You know, are we seeing the declines like they're seeing in Europe? Um, when is it safe to go out? And no one knows really those answers. So yeah, it's an, it's an answer. What can we do as a community in the meantime to help, you know, make it easier to have land managers open places and keep them open? And maybe you could all, we could also speak to like, there's some questions about how do you tell folks who are behaving badly in your lives? <laughs> um, how do you share some of this information with them? And um, with the caveat that like none of us are therapists and some of these might be relationship issues, but like how do we create a good community vibe to help keep places open once they start opening again? I can, I can kick this off, mm -hmm. I think. And this is a good question regardless if we were in the situation or not, right? Because we, we I think, touched a little bit on trail etiquette. 
or outdoor etiquette and, and how to practice it and when to practice it. Uh, I think in general, um, I always try to think of avoiding the urge to be selfish, right? When you really want that experience, you want to go to your favorite place or you're mad because 10 different people now know your secret riding spot or trail running spot or whatever it might be. Um, you know, we tend to get a little bit emotional when, when that happens to us. But I think in general, if we, if we resist the urge to be selfish, we'll lead to good practices and citizen behavior. Um, you know, I think um, self-policing is good, especially amongst your particular user group, right? So I think, you know, perhaps a, a mountain biker might be more comfortable talking to another mountain biker about something that they're seeing, like building a rogue trail or, you know, doing something um, outside of the, uh, outside of a norm that, that would um, contribute to responsible behavior. And so um, I, I think that's a good, good tool to do and not just um, on the trail, but, but really off the trail. We all have our communities of folks that we like to go outside with, right? Um, whatever, whatever it is we like to do. And so um, it, it's that mindset of um, group think, right? If, if a whole group of people says, screw this, we're going to go out and do it anyway, you're really encouraging that to spread. And so if the opposite is, hey, guys, let's be responsible as we can so that when we're out of this, you know, maybe plan a couple of trips or plan something really cool, right? So that you can kind of get it out of your system when this is all done with. But um, those are some of the things I, I would suggest. And I wanted to share just from a climber's perspective, um, you know, Access Fund, we rely really heavily on our local climbing organizations. We have, um, there's over 120 now across the country and they really help um, kind of drive what the local needs are. And during this COVID situation, we started hosting a series of regional webinars, inviting all of our board members from these LCOs to come together and discuss their more regionally based challenges. Um, and a lot of them have started coming out with some really um, great like local infographics that are being shared, um, you know, on online, social media, and, and that also really helps, I think, drive um, what needs to be happening more localized outside of our national messaging. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, respect the cl closures and then more on a personal level. Yeah, cultivate, you know, your your friends who are active and, and give them encouragement. You know, if it is like you have to stay home another week, I know it's, it stinks, you know, but, um, you know, just be encouraging and, and turn around if you see something too crowded, you know, go somewhere else. And, and that's hard, but tell others, hey, this was a little crowded. You might want to think elsewhere. And social media is good for that. Um, but yeah, I would just say, um, you know, definitely be that support group for your other friends who are who are feeling this, and uh, uh, you know, just know that we'll we'll all get through this together. Um, Tanya, there's a yeah. there's a question um, on the um, the chat here about yeah. um, maintenance, trail maintenance, and trail work that I'd like to address. Yeah, I, I want to ask one question, and then let's move to trail maintenance because I I think that's an important one too. But wanted to touch on something that Angela spoke to, which is about social media. Um, and Gabe also mentioned this too about people finding your secret spot. Um, a few folks have asked in the chat, like, what do you, what's your take on whether people should be sharing that they're going outside on social media or should we all be keeping relatively quiet about it right now? I think it's a chance to say that it's okay to be outside and to, and to like share good creative ways of being outside safely. So I, I don't think we should be ashamed of being outside. It's a pr it presents an opportunity to promote best practices for sure, rather than be silent. Yeah. Context for sure. If you're if you're 100 miles away from home, probably not a good look for you personally. Um, but if you're if you're like at a local trail, saying like this is the way that I take care of my mental health during this time, then I think that's good. Yeah. Um, all right, Todd, you want to answer that question about uh, maintenance? Um, let me. Yeah, sure. Let, do you do you have it open, or why don't I read it out so that in the recording? Yeah, sure. Know. So, some Jason asks a big part of mountain biking is maintenance and trail work, and our trails could use a lot of maintenance right now. Any suggestions about how these sorts of activities can be done safely? Um, I I do um, because we talked about this in our leadership meeting uh, just today, actually. Um, and Imba is going to start working on some guidelines on trail maintenance because right now most of the locals um, that we work with 
have uh, suspended trail maintenance days. So oftentimes we'll get together, there could be 20 plus, maybe 30 folks out there doing trail maintenance and it goes fast. Then you usually go ride or you have some sort of barbecue or cookout or something. Uh, it's very communal. Um, it's, it's a fantastic, if you've never done trail maintenance with a big group, when this is over, I recommend you do it. It's a blast, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you put pack into the trails, it's almost all volunteer. But right now is not the time to do that. The downside of that is, as the, as the poster put on here, is the trails need the maintenance, right? And we do it all the time. And almost every weekend, someone's out there, you know, rebuilding a wall, building a bridge, repairing a trail, you know, nicking a, a, a puddle, whatever it may be. Um, and there's going to be a lot of trail maintenance need to be done. The one thing that we're starting to encourage, and I don't know if, um, I don't know if it was Gary Moore in Colorado or not. I know, I know some of those guys are on the, on the call right now. Um, we're encouraging people to maybe go out in ones or twos, if you're an experienced trail maintenance person, and just do a little bit. Just do a small section and um, just what you can do. And if you're just two people, maybe you know that person, you're comfortable being around that person, stay six feet away from them. You, if you feel comfortable wearing a mask, I have my neck gaiters here, it's my team. And then we've got one from uh, mountain biking, East Coast mountain biking right there from our friends in, in the Virginia Blue Ridge. Uh, wear one of those, you know, do as, do as much as you can, then go ride your bike. Uh, don't, you know, no one's doing big groups now. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a lot of maintenance to be done after this. For one is, you know, the rainy seasons are here. We're going to catch into fire season pretty soon in the West. You know, all of this is going to happen. Plus, we're having a lot of, a lot of users out there on the trails. And uh, so the trails, are, they're going to need a lot of maintenance, um, you know, when this is over, when we can go back out there and do that. So. Great. So we just have one minute left. So I wanted to ask um, one final question of you all, which is a, a simple one, hopefully. Um, are you wearing masks when you're out recreating? We asked every, on the whole audience. I'm curious. Kevin, you aren't. Sometimes I, I've been wearing one. I've been out uh, gravel riding and road biking, and I can usually manage to wear at least uh, a buff yeah. at minimum for like 45 minutes before I before I feel out of breath. Um, but if I'm trail running by myself in a place that I know no one's going to be, then I, I won't wear it. But if I, I'm around I, people, I will. Yeah. Other than that, I look like a bandit, uh, <laughs> as my daughter say. <clears throat> Um, so here's here's how here's my rule with it because it's hard to breathe, especially if you're running or riding. Yeah, um, it can be difficult to breathe. This is pretty thin, and and I've been reading a ton of um, of information. It really it really the, only the mask does is prevent you from projecting anything to the, to the next person. It's not protecting you from that other person. Well, it's so important that we protect others from ourselves. Right, exactly. So it's so it's important. So do your job, and that's why. I'll usually wear it and ride, if I'm riding through the city or I'm riding in, you know, if you see someone, I throw the mask up. Once I'm by myself, I'll bring it down. Uh, again, we're not, I'm not going fast. So I'm not really getting my heart rate up and, and um, but yeah, like I said, do the responsible thing and, and, and wear it. Angela, you are gonna. Oh yeah, um, I, I don't think I can when I run, but I was cycling and I saw my friend with her gator and I was like, oh, I have a gator, I'm gonna try that. and I at the like stop signs and stuff, I would put up my sweatshirt. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I can definitely see where it's handy. Yep. All right, so um, we're out of time for now, but we didn't get to all the questions. There were so many wonderful questions, but we will, we've recorded this, so I will make sure that it's up on our website soon and send everyone the link along with links to all the infographics um, that Access Fund and Surf Rider and us that we shared. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, thanks for sharing your wonderful insight and for being here. Um, and yeah, thanks. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Bye everyone. Well.